Good morning, America. We got participants from several continents joining us today. today. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever in the world you are. Welcome to our webinar on enabling resilient agriculture in a drying world. I am Ole Christian Sievertsen, President and CEO of Desert Control, and I will be your host today. We have a great lineup of uh, speakers uh, and very important topics. At Desert Control, we have a vision of making Earth green again, and we realize our vision by working with farmers, growers, and landowners to improve the soil ecosystem as the foundation for optimizing sustainable productivity with efficient use of water, fertilizers, and natural resources. Maintaining productive agriculture in a drying world is not easy, but as we will hear from our speakers today, solutions inspire hope to overcome challenges. Some challenges include soil erosion and degradation, accelerated by droughts and increasing water scarcity. More than 50 billion metric tons of topsoil is estimated to have eroded since farmers began tilling the land in the US Midwest, and 52% of agricultural land worldwide is degraded. More than 50% of the United States is also under drought. The Colorado River and its reservoirs Lake Mead and Lake Powell reached their lowest levels ever this year and global water scarcity keeps growing. Now these are critical issues for agriculture, which consumes more than 70% of all available freshwater resources to produce the food that we need. And as more soil turns to sand, we will need even more water. And this is why Desert Control invented liquid natural clay, LNC in short. A 100% natural solution of clay and minerals turned into a liquid nearly as thin as water that can enable sand and degraded soil ecosystems to retain moisture and help farmers save up to 50% of their water, save fertilizers, energy and other inputs while improving productivity. After 12 years of R&D, followed by four years of independent validation and pilots in the UAE, we started our work in the United States early this year. In March, we launched a validation study with the University of Arizona at the Yuma County Cooperative Extension. And we will hear more about this from Robert Hasson and uh, Dr. Shadi al Alshran. Arizona is the hottest state in the US and finding ways to thrive in this desert can pioneer solutions on a global scale. Water here is a matter of life and death and it has always been managed carefully. But as water becomes even more scarce, farmers, growers and agribusinesses will have to push the boundaries even further. And giving up is not an option for the people that we meet here in the US Southwest. There is a saying over here that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. What we see is more collaboration than fighting though. I have a huge respect for farmers, growers and landowners who have been living off the harvest of their lands for years and generation and still every season continue to learn and discover new ways for improvement. Improving something already great is not easy. But the world is changing, and so must we. To enable resilient agriculture in a drying world, ag, tech, and innovation must be hand in hand going forward. We must produce more and better with less, and in ways that are sustainable at the same time. To talk more about this, it is my honor to introduce Edgar Guterres, Vice President of Farming Operations with Limonera Company, who will share insights on combining profitable agribusiness with stewardship for soil, land, natural resources, and our environment. Edgar, the stage is yours. Such a great pleasure and honor to, to be here sharing some of the things that we do. Uh, and just like you said, uh, I'm Edgar Gutierrez. I'm in charge of the farming of, uh, for Limonada Company. Uh, Limonada Company is a citrus um, integrated uh, producer. Uh, we've been farming for uh, 130 years. 
uh, being stewards of the land. Uh, we farm in the US, in California, um, Arizona, and as well as in Chile and Argentina. So we are responsible for over 15,000 acres of land. Um, and that's why we need to take care of all this for future generations, right? Um, so um, definitely, you know, some, some of the uh, uh, challenges uh, that we have ahead of us is uh, how do we maintain and, and be productive and, and, and be on the game, um, also taking care of all the natural resources. So the company, um, it has, you know, stewardship to the land and grave uh, in its DNA. Um, that's why we've been able to produce and maintain producing uh, over so many years. But we know that every face um, has and, and, and presents us with, with many, 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 many challenges. And nowadays, um, of course, water is one of them. Um, just to put you in a context, and it's, it's sometimes it's, it's very shocking and you don't know uh, and you hear, you know, people talking, yes, there is uh, climate impact and so on, but not until you really feel it. And as farmers feel it in our pockets, uh, a lot of times we realize that it's here, right? Uh, and that, I, I wanna share just, just a small example, right? Uh, like for example, in the San Joaquin Valley, we've been farming and nowadays, you know, when situation of water is okay, uh, we've been paying about $170 uh, for an acre foot of water, right? Um, I was confronted with a very hard decision this year uh, because from our allocations, if we wanted to provide water for all of our acres, we either had to decrease the amount of water that we are going to provide to our citrus or we will have to push some land and follow ground. So um, it's, it's a very hard decision for a farmer, right? To, to, to be in a situation where you say, well, I've been farming this land, these trees have 20, 30 years, and all of a sudden I have to push them because I have to choose between all of my trees who am I going to provide water for? Because otherwise there is no viability in doing it uh, because of the price. So just to make a long story very short and, and to get to this point, I had to pay $2,000 for an acre foot with a rolling fee because I had to buy it from Oilware and actually provide that water to a part of our farm. And then at the end, I had to push 45 acres. So these are real things. You know, these are real situations that we find ourselves in today uh, in order to, to keep on with the game. So we know all of this and um, we've been doing, you know, many, many practices or many cultural practices for many years. Um, but we, as a company, are focused in, in, in it's, it's in our mission um, to be uh, sustainable and to include, for example, pillars, very important pillars for us as renewable energy. We've been working with solar fields since 2006. Um, healthy soils, we do a tremendous amount of practices in our healthy soil program. Uh, for example, with uh, partnerships with Agramin, where we, where we produce um, from all the green clippings from homes in the Ventura County area, we gather those, we compost them, and then we put them back into our field. All of our pruning clippings, all of these, um, are incorporated in our soils as well. Um, 
we do all the injections continuously on every injection that we do. We produce our own algae and continue to inject it every single day when we have the opportunity to do it. Um, one of the other uh, components of this healthy soils program that we have is the inclusion of cover crops as well. Um, so all of these, all of these practices over the period of years, of course, they have been given us many, many advantages. And just to put another example, you know, so some of the some of the impacts that we've had today is the increase of fuel, the increase of the cost of fertilizers, and so on. And um, intrinsically, all of this will actually help in the reduction of it, or actually to maintain, you know, a, a certain cost. We've been able in the last three years to actually maintain our cost per acre. Um, and it's not just one action, right? It's, it's a series of actions. It's a series of practices that we put in place. Another one of the pillars that uh, have helped us to, to go through this, maintaining the same, same cost of production, um, is, for example, our, our biodiversity pillar. And in our biodiversity pillar, we, this is very important, we, we're very, we've been actually, we've been pioneers uh, since 1928 of uh, biological releases, of bio, biological uh, beneficial insect production, uh, where we've been able to establish a uh, balance, a good balance, and, and trying to minimize the use of, of pesticides. And one of the recent things that we've been doing um, is creating biological corridors. Uh, we've been on every uh, new plantation that we do, uh, we're actually planting um, a series of plants, a mixture of plants that basically what they are, are it's, it's, I call them fuel stations. Because fuel, sta fuel stations is just a, it's the plant that will provide uh, sugar for beneficial insects to actually adventure themselves inside the, the orchards. So we have created these biological corridors of these um, different mixtures that we've been trying, um, which is also another one of the components uh, between the, the pillar of, of biological uh, or biodiversity enhancement uh, inside of our orchards. And one last uh, pillar uh, that we that we have engraved also in our DNA is uh, water stewardship. Um, we this is this is very interesting because a, a lot of times as farmers um, we've been irrigating by many methods, right? And a lot of times these methods come from things that you've been doing in the past, uh, right? Uh, well, we irrigate this much, we know this part of the farm takes this much water and so on. But one of the things is that if we don't measure, uh, we won't be able to improve, right? And a lot of times um, because of different, of the different situations, you know, a lot of times, we uh, receive water from different districts and so on, and we have um, we have just, for example, um, times when we have to irrigate, not necessarily what the crop needs. Um, so we've been including a lot of technology also in our um, in our way of doing uh, irrigation. Uh, We've been using platforms as FiTech, Wisecon, to really hone in into how much do we really uh, need to water uh, and when do we need to water. So it's very interesting. We've been, we've been measuring sometimes reductions of up to 37% from previous practices. Uh, and then at an average, just by the fact of of being so diligent on a daily basis on actually um, knowing what the tree needs. Um, and on average, we reduce about 20% of the use of water um, just by doing this. 
So there is a lot of hope, um, you know, in, in all of this. Uh, we've always said, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, we, need, we need to be pushed. We need to, to find ourselves sometimes in difficult situations to get out of our comfort zone. And, uh, and it's not bad, you know, a lot of people says uh, or, or thinks of this in a negative way, but it's not. It's actually how we evolve. It's actually how we become better. Um, and uh, so, you know, aside, you know, from yes, difficult times, challenges, you know, it's, it's exciting. It's actually very exciting. And then um, we have initiatives like LNC, you know, which is, another component of all of this and that uh, that we're also very excited to to test so yes there is hope we're doing it and it's very exciting thank you very much and i think uh, you you showed everyone some great examples of how combining various key pillars of sustainability is actually really also driving the the profitability of your your business and uh um, thanks for your inspirational message of hope um, and your way of integrating technologies and innovations uh, to actually push the boundaries even further. So thank you, Edgar. Um, I will now um, uh, open the floor for uh, Robert uh, Masson. The stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Ole, for uh, inviting me to this lecture here. Edgar, it was, it was great to hear about what's going on um, in the citrus world. It's not great to hear how expensive water it is, but it is, it is great to hear that, that you're able to reduce 20% efficiency. That's, that's huge. So big congratulations to you and your team for, for looking at that. Uh, so as Uli mentioned, my name is Robert Masson. I'm employed by the University of Arizona as an agricultural extension agent for Yuma County. Um, I'm here today to talk to you first and foremost about the drought situation that we have in Arizona. Uh, we are entirely dependent, the, the seven basin states uh, of California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico are heavily dependent upon the Colorado River uh, to provide us with water and fertile soil because uh, the places that we do agriculture in these areas tend to be the uh, alluvial river bottoms. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little history lesson of the Colorado River and how it's divided. In 1922, uh, the Colorado River Pact was formed between the seven basin states dividing uh, the flow at the time that uh, was uh, 15 million acre feet uh, into uh, these uh, 7.5 million acre feet for the northern basin, upper basin, and 7.5 in the lower basin, and then divided amongst each state with, in the lower basin, 2.8 million acre feet going to Arizona, 4.4 to California, and 300,000 to Nevada. Um, this was further expanded in 1944 when we gave uh, Mexico 1.5 million acre feet of the Colorado River, so um, essentially to keep them out of World War II. Um, plus um, to formalize the existing contracts that were there. Um, also, um, so this puts us on paper as having uh, the Colorado River being 16.5 million acre feet. The issue is that we've been in a 20 year mega drought and now the flow of the river is 11 million acre feet. And so we're, we're at a big disparity there. We're 5 million short. And so every year we've been, uh, having uh, more go out of the system than is entering the system, leaving us in uh, a state of severe water restrictions. So next year, they're implementing tier 2A water restrictions, reducing uh, the 2.8 million acre feet and originally intended in the, the contract to 2.2 million acre feet, losing uh, 592,000 acre feet uh, every year. So um, this is a big challenge for uh, the county that, that I serve, Yuma County, Arizona, located at the intersection of California, Arizona, and Mexico, which is 
now the end of the Colorado River because right at the US-Mexico border, it all gets put into a canal to serve that 1.5 million acre feet going to, to Mexico. So the Colorado River no longer reaches the Sea of Cortez, every drop of it's used. So Yuma uh, is known as the Nile of Americas when it was settled uh, because it had that similar uh, river uh, you know, flooding and alluvial river bottoms as areas as the Nile uh, Delta in uh, Egypt. Um, it is a big producer of leafy green vegetables, number three in the nation for vegetables and melon production. It's also known as the winter salad bowl of the United States, where 90% of domestic production of leafy greens are grown through the months of November to March. So it's a heavy hitter in the vegetable world. And water is needed to grow all of this, which as Edgar mentioned, has been pretty plentiful up until it just seems like a few years ago, which now we're facing our, our big restrictions. Um, again, I work for the University of Arizona. We are a land grant institution with focus on public education. Extension in particular uh, focuses on extending the resources of the university out into the community, providing them with um, evaluation of new ag technologies, public education, and acting as a neutral facilitator of positive change. Looking at that hope that Edgar mentioned and really is so famous for and um, helping to um, change that from just a dream into something that's an, an everyday occurrence. And so by acting as a neutral third party, uh, we're able to uh, help provide testing services and education um, both to the public and to the companies um, and organizations interested in spreading this type of change. So uh, we partnered with Desert Control um, to create a five-year uh, research trial in Yuma, Arizona, looking at um, LNC formulations and their effectiveness, uh, immediate effectiveness and their effectiveness over time. Uh, we created a two-factor experiment where first of all, we're looking at the formulations. So an untreated control or a UTC, just bare sand was used at our Yuma County um, Agricultural Farm Mesa Station where it's very sandy soil. We took a part of the farm that hasn't been used before and we uh, used it for this trial. Uh, so we took UTC and then three mixes of the LNC product. And then we, the second factor that we looked at was irrigation rate. We had two rates, kind of a, a high irrigation rate and a, a mid irrigation rate, just so we could see if there was any difference there. We had a total of nine replications in, in all of our plots. So we made a, a checkerboard pattern across the field with these different mixes. Um, we, five of those reps were dedicated to large beds where we grow watermelons and romaine hearts, crops that are standard for this region. And four, four of those nine reps were used to grow small bedded crops um, like bell pepper and celery, which we were growing on 42 inch rows. It's the difference between 42 inch rows for the small beds and 84 inch rows for row spacing for the large beds. In the spring of 2020, uh, we mixed uh, the, the LNC product using their Mirage unit, which I don't have any pictures of because you know um, I wanted to maintain discretion. So uh, they mix their product, which involved mixing a mineral clay into their Mirage unit, which liquefied it, basically turning it the consistency of a milk. So it's milk instead of mud, if you if you can picture that. Still very slick. And then we sprayed it out with these nurse tanks um, in a heavy concentration out to the field. Uh, Roto tilled it in made our beds, uh, planted our crops. And so we ended up with this checkerboard pattern, as you can see, right on the edge of the desert. So this is desert stand, sand, superstition sand is, is the soil type. We tortured some bell peppers. Uh, they, they don't like the drought and boy, we gave them plenty. And uh, we learned several things that, that season. Um, so we looked at it for yield, took the yields on every plot, graded it for quality and for, for damage. On the right there, that's blossom end rot, uh, some uh, uh, 
that typically originates from high heat and also nutrient deficiency and the uneven spread of calcium throughout the fruit. Um, we, we grew watermelon as well as bell pepper. Uh, we did, uh, took fruit yield, sugar, uh, also biomass, above ground biomass readings. Uh, so the results were this. Uh, we noticed right away that there was a lateral movement of water lessening transplant shock mortality. So water was moving across the beds and not just down like a bullet, which we, is what was happening with the, the UTC. And so we definitely noticed a difference in, sur in survivorship. Here's this graph is a, the stand count, as you can see, as uh, a 10% LSD on the right is is formulation D um, had the, the highest number of, of plants, stand counts, basically survivorship. Um, I'm sorry, on the bottom, if you look on the left, it's UTC uh, with, had the highest mortality, formulation A um, had, was kind of sorting in the middle of, of between two groups and then B between the two groups, but definitely formulation D, we saw a statistically significant difference in mortality. So again, that's from the water, from the drip going down the middle of a 42 inch bed, moving laterally across the bed instead of vertically straight straight down. Um, we learned a lot from this trial. Um, we didn't see the yield differences, but that's not because of anything that was wrong with the product. It was uh, that we, were, we needed to refine our irrigation method. We need to focus on uh, banking soil moisture in the soil um, and, and rather than just putting out enough uh, for the plant to survive and testing it that way. So we learned a lot the first season and we learned that the next crop that we grow, we had to increase the, the amount of water that we're putting out with each irrigation and decrease the amount of time between irrigations. And that would help us bank that soil moisture instead of just give the plant enough, basically in a hydroponic situation. Um, and so Doing that, we adjusted our methods and we went back and we did a fall planting where we seeded some romaine uh, using this belt planter. It's old, it's an oldie but a goodie. Um, it's not a vacuum seeder, it's an old belt planter. Um, definitely good for consistent planting, getting that singulation, seed singulation that's so important. We also transplanted celery. These are all commercial varieties uh, of celery and of romaine. Um, in the exact same, using the exact same methods that commercial industry does here in Yuma. This is what it looks like um, after establishment and development. And so it's, it's all growing well. Uh, we had the wet date of 922 and uh, it's been growing since. The celery variety is uh, Tozier 6200 and the romaine is uh, Syngenta uh, duquines. Duquesnes, I don't know how to say it, du, Duquesnes, Duques, Duquesne, Duquesne. And so um, right now we're, we haven't harvested either yet. We're about two weeks away from the romaine harvest and we're several, several weeks away from the, the celery. So the way we've been rating it uh, is by doing canopy evaluations uh, where we using an NDVI hand, handheld a green seeker unit uh, like like the one I have here in my hand, which helps to quantify the difference between uh, uh, canopy measurements. Uh, so low value, the ground will it basically reads green, the difference between green and brown, and it will give a number with the higher the number uh, between zero and one, with the higher high the number being more green, the lower the number being more brown. And so you, you can use this in two different ways. One is to evaluate canopy density because it'll pick up on the ground below it. So that's brown, it'll have a lower score, right? If you have a, uh, a partially filled canopy where you can visually see a lot of brown, it will score lower than something that's dense, which has more green, which will score high. Maybe the difference between a 0.6 and a, and a 0.8. And then later in the season, when you have a closed canopy, canopy it's very good at, uh, reading the differences in green, greenness of your closed can canopy with the higher values associated with higher plant health, more chlorophyll, et cetera. 
So we took two ratings of this, 70 days after planting and 78 days after planting. I'm gonna show you the 78 days of planting results. So again, remember we have two factors here on the left, we have a lower irrigation. And so uh, I'll let Shadi explain more about this MAD 50 and MAD, MAD 30, but just it's, it's less water uh, on the, uh, the, the MAD 50. So as you can see, uh, it's very much uh, sorting statistically this is at the 10% level with uh, the UTC untreated control at 0.77 NDVI, and then all the treated at 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.85. And remember, this is the lower water uh, uh, factor, factor two. In the higher water area, we have saw that similar trend of 0 0.78, 0 0.82, 0 0.83, 0 0.83. And it's, it's also important to note, I think, that uh, that this 0.78 of the UTC of the, of the area that had more water is even less than the LNC products that had uh, less water. So um, I think that's kind of just important to note uh, that it's performing better uh, uh, than, um, than, than all of these here. All right, uh, looking at the celery, we saw similar trends. So 0.72 with the UTC, 0 0.78, 0 0.77, 0 0.81, again, 0 0.76, 0 0.81, 0 0.82, 0 0.83. So similar results uh, in the celery. Uh, so what we noticed uh, for a summary so far, remember we haven't have harvested it yet, is we definitely saw differences in canopy development observed for both crops. Um, and we're going to harvest the remaining two weeks. The celery is continuing to grow. We chose celery because it has a very high water requirement, a very poor root structure, requiring 1.5 to 2.5 uh, acre feet and water with the highest demands a month before harvest, which we're just entering into now. So really, we want to focus the rest of our trial in giving it the proper water that you would need for a production center, uh, setting. So we, we want to keep it pretty wet. Uh, until the end. And, and we're really going to, you know, see what the difference in water holding uh, will be uh, for, uh, in the, the yields for, for that celery, as well as monitoring how much we're using. And with that, I'd just like to conclude. Again, this is a five-year study. So uh, the results that we're seeing really need to be uh, vetted and verified over time uh, through the multiple crops that, that we're growing before any conclusions can be made and forecast for the um, shelf life or the, 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 the effectiveness of the product over time. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Robert. Uh, it's very nice to see the work that the university is doing in these um, uh, fields, uh, not just for, for, for the LNC reference here, but the other types of initiatives that you mentioned. Uh, and thanks for the great history lesson on water in, uh, in Arizona. Um, so to, to, to everyone, if you have questions for Robert, uh, feel free to start pushing them into the Q&A function and we will address them uh, at the end. I, I also want to say that Robert maintains a very informative and good newsletter uh, that comes out pretty frequently. I will share a link to sign up to that newsletter for those of you who are interested in that in the follow-up email from, uh, from after this webinar. So um, thank you, Robert, and uh, let's uh, bring uh, Dr. Shadi into, uh, into the uh, stage here. So um, Shadi, you're going to talk a little bit more about um, the technicalities of, uh, of soil and soil ecosystems. Um, again, thank you, Ola, um, um, for this um, um, webinar. Uh, my name is um, I'm Shadi Alishra. I have a PhD in soil science and I employed by Desert Control um, America. And um, today well, we'll be talking about, I'll be talking about the um, sandy soils and how to improve the sandy soil quality um, for um, vegetable um, um, productions and um, um, different implementation. Um, see if I can. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, talking about the sandy soils, there is, um, despite there is a, a little agreement on the exact um, definition um, of, of sandy soils, but in this presentation, um, we will define sandy soils as the, as the soils that has uh, have an average sand um, higher than 50% and the clay content um, less than um, 10%, 20%. And this includes soil textures of, of sandy loam, uh, loamy sand, and, and sand. Um, according to the um, um, USDA soil um, texture um, classification. Um, then if we look at the first um, uh, graph here, which is the uh, sand, silt, and clay. So this is the soil texture refers to the proportion of sand, silt, and clay. and um, Starting with the finest uh, um, uh, clay particles are the, the smaller um, than smaller particles and smaller than 0 0.002 millimeter, while uh, silt is between two, uh, I mean 0 0.002 to 0 0.05 millimeters, and um, sand ranges from 0.05 to um, two um, millimeters. So um, Soil texture uh, profoundly affect soil drainage, uh, water holding capacity, soil temperature, soil erosion, as well as uh, fertility and productivity. Um, so globally, um, sandy soils um, cover um, about 31% of the total land area based on the definitions um, uh, we just presented. Um, these large area um, of sandy soils are found in, in the, at the edge of edges of the continents. Um, also, they occur in the middle of the continents, mostly in the arid and semi-arid um, regions. So, with that 31 percent, um, um, in, in, in 2018, uh, it was estimated uh, that about 35 percent um, is is a Burn um, soil is basically a um, desert, followed by grassland, um, shrubland, savanna, and about 6% of the sandy soils of the world are under forest. Um, however, only less than 4% of the sandy soils are used as a cropland. So switching now about these um, 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 sandy soil characteristics. Um, so basically sandy soils are, are a group, uh, as a group of soils um, are unique soils. Um, they have a specific set of soil physical and, and like chemical uh, 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 properties. And it's well known that sandy soils are droughty soils. Um, so they, they dry um, um, fast. Um, because they retain less um, uh, water when, when wet. So I tried to divide these characteristics um, on like high and low. So I'm not gonna mention all the characteristics, just maybe the most important ones. Um, so sandy soils, they have um, um, high hydraulic conductivity, which means it has a high infiltration, a good drainage, um, but also resulted in um, deep percolation water loss, um, which is and the corresponding nutrients and chemical leaching. Um, also, it's a guy, the sandy soils has a, um, a high gas permeability, which is good soil aeration, good for the plants and the gas exchange between the soil atmosphere and the atmosphere. Um, but also this might result in a high organic matter decomposition rates because of the abundance of um, the oxygen. Also, it has a high specific heat, which means it, it warms faster than the clay soils during spring, which is very important for the um, seeds germination and um, um, early uh, blooming. Um, but again, it dries faster um, during summer, so uh, a frequent um, irrigation is, uh, um, is required. So these uh, properties actually makes um, sandy soil a desirable medium for growing crops if there is no limitation in applying water and nutrient. It's easy to work with, it's a light soil. Also, um, sandy soils, they have low water holding capacity. Um, it has lack of small pores. The gravitational uh, water movement is the dominant force uh, within the sand um, profile. 
Um, there is a weak um, soil to water um, interaction, so therefore frequent irrigation um, is required. Also, it has a, a low carrying exchange capacity because it's, it's, it's big, the sand particles, so it has a small surface area compared to um, um, finer materials um, like um, uh, clay. And it's considered to be um, um, infertile soil, uh, and it has no ability to supply crops with nutrients or retain them against um, 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 leaching. Um, organic matter, um, typically, I would say it's less than 1% on most of the sandy soils. It varies between region to region um, because of the high decomposition um, rates and um, other climatic um, um, conditions. Um, so these properties, I want to just go quickly about this, um, these three concepts here or um, definitions for the available water field capacity and parameter point because I'm going to use them um, um, now. So this graph shows the available water held by different um, um, textured soils um, between sand all the way um, to clay. And um, as the sand fraction um, increases, the available water decreases. And which is the, um, the dark, or let's say like the blue um, area here. So the upper storage limit, that's the um, field capacity, which is the, the maximum amount of water that can be held against the gravity, usually after the irrigation, two days after irrigation. That's how much um, that might represents the field capacity for that field. Um, permanent rooting point is the point where there's no available water for the plants and the plants can't extract that water from the soil. And the difference between the um, field capacity and permanent rooting point represents the, um, uh, the available water or, or the water holding capacity. So um, in general, um, sandier, um, light texture um, soils need um, to be irrigated more frequently because it has a narrow um, available water compared to the um, uh, clay uh, soil. And then we we'll to talk a little bit about the um, liquid natural clay, LNC, um, to improve the sandy soil qualities. Um, so basically, it's an environmentally friendly technology. So there is no added um, chemicals, uh, only natural materials applied. Uh, actually, we fix kind of the soil with soil. Um, its immediate um, results can be observed after the LNC application. And um, um, I said here one day after application, but in reality, it's even less than that. And it's easier to integrate with different application methods um, because of the LNC itself is a very um, light, thin material, as thin as water. Uh, and and um, we, we've done some lab uh, measurements and you look at it, it just water, is, it's not a, a slurry as some people might uh, throw off. Um, so we obtained um, some results from our um, um, experimentation at uh, Yuma Mesa, um, Arizona. I'm not gonna go over the um, experimental design. Robert uh, did a great job on that. And um, um, with this collaborative multi-year field study between um, Desert Control and the University of Arizona um, to improve the soil, um, sandy soil quality, which is, um, the um, texture analysis um, shows that that land has um, the sand percentage is more than 95%. So it's a completely um, sand, um, uh, sandy soil. So this experiment, we were looking at different LNC formulations. So we want to compare the LNC versus the um, control, which is untreated. And also we try to optimize the um, LNC formulations. And um, in this graph, um, it shows the water retention curve under different LNC versus the control. And it's clear here that the LNC, regardless of formulation, has a higher moisture content at different moisture points, which means at the saturation, at the field capacity, and the permanent uh, wilting point, which resulted in a higher water retention 
for these soils. So to sim simplify the, the, um, the previous um, uh, graph, we estimated the relative improvement in the water holding capacity relative to the control. And uh, we found that um, formulas A, B, and D increase the water holding capacity by between 26 to, to 92%, um, almost double the water retention compared to sand and oil. Um, also, we looked um, at the um, um, chemical properties improvement in the sandy soils, and basically it's the CEC. Uh, um, it's, it's really important um, a property for any soil to have a good CEC, which represents the ability of the soil to um, absorb um, cations and make it available for the plants um, throughout the growing um, season. Um, so also we analyzed the uh, cation exchange capacity and this figure shows that um, regardless um, of the used formulation, the LNC formulation, um, the CEC increased um, from 12 to all the way to 37%. So that's actually a big change in the CEC within the same soil. And I wanna mention here that we we are not changing the soil texture. So the soil texture will be the same, but what we're changing is the soil behavior. So we maintain the good properties of the sandy soils that a grower like, but we make that soil to behave more of a, of a loamy soil um, that will hold more water and uh, uh, nutrients. Also, we were looking at the um, water distribution um, under the LNC compared to the control. And in this picture here, we took uh, measurements um, for the wetting width um, under the um, drip um, irrigation. So in the middle, we have a drip line, two drip lines, and um, then we dug up two holes just to see the width, the um, wetting um, uh, width. And what we found is under the LNC, the wetting width were, was 50% higher um, than the control, which means we, we kind of improved or encouraged the soil to have a, a, a lateral water flow instead of completely um, a vertical flow, which is the common water flow in the sandy soils. So that's the um, um, expected um, in the sandy soil. So now the soil, it can hold more water at the surface. It gives the water enough time to move um, 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 laterally. And this behavior also is really important, which might help expanding the root, rooting zone um, horizontally as the, also the LNC might maximize the nutrients accessibility, accessibility of roots, knowing that some of these vegetable crops, they have shallow roots. Um, for example, the celery, the most active roots are within the top six inches. In another project, a uh, different project, we monitor also the soil water distribution in the soil profile um, using multi-depth soil moisture sensor um, down to, um, uh, from zero to 55 centimeters. And um, the LNC treated depth in this uh, project was about um, 30 centimeters. And as we can see from in this graph here, the both LNC versus control, they have opposite um, water distribution. Um, we, we found more water in the top surface um, down to 25, even to 40 centimeters, which is where the active roots are, where's the nutrients over there. It's rich um, 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 layer of, of nutrients compared to the control, which actually indicates that there is more leaching might happen in the control. So I wanna say here, both um, control and trees that they receive the same amount of water, but there is a, a, a complete different uh, water um, distribution. So in conclusion, um, LNC improved the um, physical and, and the chemical um, sandy soil properties while maintaining um, good characteristic sandy soils 
um, as a growing medium, um, including good drainage and um, irrigation and the ease to work and cultivate. And uh, with that, um, thank you. And uh, Ula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Shadi. Um, uh, lots of interesting data. Um, uh, and uh, let me also remind everyone uh, on the data shared from uh, the uh, work that we have ongoing at the university premises. These are interim observations. Uh, so uh, uh, take them with, uh, with caution. Um, uh, there will be uh, complete reports uh, coming out uh, as harvests are done and analysis are, are done. Um, and um, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much uh, to, uh, to Shadi, and we will uh, welcome Dr. Orn to the stage here. So, thank you uh, very Yeah. Thank you very much, Ori Christian. Do you see my slide? Yeah. We see it. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and is it my honor to present? the result from the UAE today. And this is the second time for our webinar in the US. And I can see and hear the real need to use water efficiently. Yep. Let's start. Yep. I would like to start with our principle for research and development. Our company is side driven with a focus of field proven. In result and management, the data that we capture and monitor, we analyze and make up all the information as we retain and preserve them as the core backbone of our company. I will start the presentation with a simplified layout of the monitoring and data capture process for validation, pilot, and the field trial. It is very important to start because there are always a question, how do we get this data? How reliable of our data? In the commercial pilot, the design always includes LNC treatment with associated control plot for reference. In the scientific validation, the experimental design, same as what Robert has been mentioned, is always part of our experimental design. And the replication, more than three replication, has been put in place for evaluate our result. And I would like to spend a little time explain the methodology because it is very important as well for the how we get this data. First of all, soil sample from before and after treatment were collected to evaluate chain of fertility and ability to retain water and nutrient. Each plot is set up with separate irrigation lines. And each irrigation line has dedicated water flow meter to capture the amount of water usage. And the data is uploaded to the cloud. We also install soil sensor for both LNC treated and the control plot. The amount of water to up to apply or use as a water usage is maintained by using soil moisture content. The water consumption between treated and control is calculated into water saving. Combining water consumption data with the crop yield data provide valuable water use efficiency. This is a control data analytic platform provide and collect all the data from the soil sensor. And then the system also provide live dashboard, interim flash report and final report for the pilot project. Now, LNC is field proven as I has mentioned and increased soil and desert sand to be able to retain water. 
field pilot in the UAE has been conducted with varying crops, such as vegetable, animal feed, dead palm, fruit tree, native species tree, turf, and mid landscape plant. Completed report for the validation is available. And if you want more detail, please reach out to us. In today's presentation, I will focus on key results from the UAE. First one is the scientific validation by independent research organization start, started in 2018. The, the validation is for crop production was complete, completed in 2020 by International Center for Biosalai and Agriculture in Dubai. Permillet, watermelon, and zucchini has been cultivated in open field on desert environment. And the result is continued started from March to September. Result documented improved yield and water use efficiency for LNC treated plot compared to the control. Water use efficiency of Sugini increased by 62%, permeate by 28%, and watermelon by 17%. The indication of soil health improvement as the soil analysis after harvest has shown increased soil organic matter and reduced soil salinity on the soil surface. The fertility of sandy soil improved it by increased cation exchange capacity, available phosphorus, and exchangeable potassium in the soil. Next project is a positive impact, which is Igor has mentioned about increased biodiversity using native species to bring more beneficial insect. Insect. This is one of the projects that we see the positive impact of the LNC on native forest tree. The result of the afforestation project after the first year of LNC treatment, results have proven that LNC can reduce water consumption required to maintain healthy native tree in arid condition by 60% and require only one third of irrigation operation per week. The soil analysis result for water holding capacity and plant available water present an increase in treated soil compared compare with the controlled soil. The fertility of sandy soil also improved by increase of cation exchange capacity, available phosphorus and exchangeable potassium which retain in the soil. It is contribute to higher fruit yield in first tree to support the increase of biodiversity of above ground and below ground in the forest. The indication of soil health improvement show increased soil organic matter, which align with the other UAE experiment. In 2021, the commercial pilot with Mawarik holding investment was expanded to improve date palm production. Date palm is very important crop for food security in the UAE. LNC treatment increased available nutrient in the soil, which were highly consumed by the palm tree for their development. The result of the first year of LNC treatment also show a statistically significant impact on fruit yield and contributed to grade A increase. The management of irrigation of the treated palm tree was using 46% irrigation reduction compared with the control palm tree. We continue to observe the increase of soil organic matter, plant available water, and cation exchange capacity in the treated soil. Please feel free to reach out to us for more detail. We are happy to arrange following up meeting for the deep discussion. In conclusion, the LNC is a solution 
and is science lead and still proven to positive increase sandy soil and desert soil ability to absorb, retain, and store water. It reduces leaching, deep drainage, and runoff. As a result, less water is required to maintain and produce crop. LNC being developed by 12 years of R&D, followed by four years of validation initiative, field study, and pilot in the UAE. We have consistent result of water saving between 35 to 50%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have... <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. On. Um, and um, um, for, for I see some questions are coming in on uh, the presentations being available. So we will make the presentations uh, available and also the recording of the of the webinar. Uh, lots of data here, lots of data from the UAE as well. And uh, in the UAE, uh, many of these projects are being executed um, uh, from the buildup of the uh, uh, exclusive joint venture um, company and, and relationship we have set up for uh, the sales and delivery of LNC in the Middle East with uh, Mawarid, the, the company named Mawarid Desert Control. So for those of you from uh, the Middle East region who are interested, um, uh, please feel free to reach out to, uh, to Mawarid Desert Control and we can help you get connected there as well. And for those of you in the US or other places of the world, uh, feel free to, to, to reach out on us uh, uh, on, uh, on more questions. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce uh, to you uh, Mr. Charlie Granfeld. Uh, uh. Okay, um, I will uh, take you through a little bit where we are on the uh, development phase of uh, the US organization of uh, Desert Control. Uh, my name is Charlie Granfeld, I'm the Group Chief Commercial Officer uh, for Desert Control. And um, if anything, timing is everything. And if it's meant to happen, it will at the right time for, for the right reasons. And never could a quote be more accurate. It's an anonymous uh, author of that quote, but uh, I take it to heart. Um, for us, we haven't been uh, active for a very long time in the US market, but um, uh, there have been some significant milestones and the reason for being there. Uh, one of which uh, uh, is actually Robert Masson from the University of Arizona inviting us to Yuma, saying that there are over 4,000 uh, sun hours per year in uh, Yuma, uh, and there is sandy soil as uh, any desert uh, in the world. So it's a really a relevant place to start. Um, another thing is that uh, that was important for us to do the academic validations to prove uh, that, that this is functioning well. The second milestone was the commercial pre-projects that we just recently landed together with um, Limonera. Um, and that has been uh, crucial also to make sure that we have a commercial validation, that uh, our product is uh, actually functioning uh, in a commercial uh, growth. And that is what we're testing now in California and uh, Arizona. Um, and of course, the uh, third pillar here is to how to build an organization around this to make sure that we match the organic uh, growth as we progress. Well, first of all, um, we had some expectations going into this. We had an initial plan where we're going to do in this sort of sequential order, academic validations, um, uh, doing pilots, testing, and then hope to, to do initial commercialization by, as you can see here of the slide, uh, towards the end of 2023, going forward into uh, 24 as full-scale commercialization. Um, thanks to what we have noticed uh, and, and realized already, uh, accelerated by uh, good indications, um, not final results, as has been mentioned, but good indications, that have been enough 
to match the window and, and the urgency uh, that uh, is here. Uh, we've been able to commercialize earlier than anticipated. So our revised expectation now is that we are uh, commercially uh, up and running uh, and building on that and hope to be commercializing full scale towards the end of 2023. And that is uh, a full year ahead of expectation. Our ambition in 2023 is, of course, to build a pipeline of uh, commercial projects and pre-projects, as we call them. Pre-projects are uh, not taking on the full grove or the full farm, but to uh, do it in a sizable manner in order to get a, a good, uh, solid uh, uh, ground for uh, validations and, and, uh, uh, and monitoring so that we can get the information we need to also build our competence uh, and uh, uh, our experience in the American uh, market. So this is what we're going to do in 2023. And for that to happen, we of course need to build an organization that meets uh, our ambitions. Uh, so, I'm happy to say that at the moment we are in the final stages of the recruitment of a new managing director for the US uh, and Desert Control Americas. We're also currently onboarding a sales team that will be based in Yuma. That's our first uh, sales team and uh, we have taken on board experienced uh, salespeople. Um, from, from the uh, ag and the ag tech background. We're also focusing very much on organic growth of our operations team. That means that we're not building an organization first and hope to see what projects come our way. We actually try to balance this so that we are growing organically as we sign new pre-projects. We have a month ago opened up our first satellite combination of office workshop warehouse in Yuma, Arizona. And that is a, a big landmark for us. And we have our first uh, true operational and commercial base in uh, the US. We maintain our R&D lab and greenhouse for testing uh, various crops in Maricopa Agricultural Center uh, with the University of Arizona, also called MAC. And we have an administrative office facility in Chandler in Phoenix. So this means that we have established ourselves and that, uh, are determined to do so even further. Uh, but these uh, developments are the latest in the US market and very significant for our continued growth and we are hoping also for a very successful future here. So thank you, Ulle, back to you. Perfect, good. We will then turn to our Q&A and um, there's uh, quite a few questions that have come in. We will be efficient with our time as we're a little bit over, but uh, very valuable questions coming in. So we'll spend some time on them. One of the first questions coming in um, is, is related to Sort of, is it, uh, is it um, uh, you know, wise to be farming in the desert? Why are we farming in desert areas? And I know, I mean, um, looking at areas like Yuma, there are things that are done more efficiently in places uh, like Yuma than anywhere else in the world. Uh, there are also crops that uh, only thrive in these type of environments. But maybe Robert and Edgar, could you uh, share your thoughts on, uh, on this? <clears throat> Sure. Uh, so Yuma is the, the perfect intersection uh, for growth during the winter months. Uh, having a very close proximity to the Colorado River and uh, that rich alluvial soil that comes from flooding of the Colorado River, seasonal flooding, um, <clears throat> and the mild winters has made it a great place for production uh, historically. Yeah. 
And, and, and Edgar, your, your thoughts here um, on uh, farming. You have places like Yuma and Cadiz, um, desert uh, farming conditions. Yes. Um, well, one of the things, and I'm, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about citrus and, and tree crops, right? But I think deserts offer a tremendous potential for, for controlling certain certain conditions. It gives you that opportunity to, right, to do it. Um, and we're never satisfied with, okay, if I have too much rain, if I have too much sun, right? But I think deserts actually give you a little bit more of opportunity to, for manipulations of certain conditions that could mean um, very interesting results and you know we talk about shade structures we talk about solar uh fields we talk about maximization of space we, there are many things that deserts uh, give you great opportunities right uh but of course you know you, you have to you have to elaborate around them um but uh but these are great areas to do for you. Yeah, even, even looking at things like differences in daytime and nighttime temperatures. Uh, photosynthesis happens in the warmth of daytime and then respiration mostly happens at night. And so when using of those sugars by the plant to make um, you know, starch structures happens during at night. And so when you have warm days and cool nights, you build more sugar rather than converting mm -hmm. it to starch. So you get sweeter fruit, sweeter cantaloupe, sweeter lettuce, sweeter citrus. And, and then having low moisture means uh, like low rain, it, less, it rains less than three inches a year here in Yuma. We, uh, it, it helps to lower the disease because when you have a, a rain, you have that wetness on the leaf, it can cause a downy mildew pretty fast. And so being able to control, have that water on demand from the river, the low rain, low disease, um, the great uh, diurnal, diurnal temperature um, changes are, are large factors of, of why we grow here as well. It sounds like the perfect conditions for uh, what today is uh, called uh, precision agriculture, right? So, yeah, so is there anything uh, uh, that we can learn from farming in the deserts uh, that can be transferred to other areas? I mean, we hear a lot about desertification and the loss of agricultural land and land going out of productivity, et cetera. I mean, in the desert, uh, would you say that we're kind of at the forefront on some of these areas? And how could that be relevant for other areas of farming? Um, Edgar. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, I think we are at the forefront. Um, a lot of times we don't look to, we don't want to look for these uh, challenges because it is a challenge to farm in the desert. Um, but as Robert was mentioning, there are many, many uh, benevolent conditions for high quality fruits. For example, um, I can tell you that some of our highest quality fruit is grown in the desert. Um, mm -hmm. And we grow in many other places. Um, so yes, there we are at the forefront is we've been so used to um, gravitating to, I would say easier lands to farm. Um, but I think uh, we have to move into that frontier uh, because uh, more and more uh, we are in need of, of different ways of, of doing farming. So yes, the deserts uh, are a, a very uh, interesting area to do farming. An amazing resource, in in other words. I mean, we see places like uh, like uh, Arizona getting 
like 10 to 12 cuts per year on crops like alfalfa, which, uh, which is quite, uh, quite unique as well. And I think it also goes to being able to supply fresh produce all year round. I mean, you need to have farming in different regions to also have, uh, you know, fresh lemons all year round because they will potentially bloom and, and, and be harvested at various times of the year as well. <clears throat> so and studies studies have been done by um, some researchers at the University of Arizona, including Charlie Sanchez, looking at irrigation efficiency. And, and in our river bottom soils, they're, they're about 85% efficient. But in our sandy areas that are close by, maybe only about 60% 60, 60 efficient. So we measure, these are, these are the types of things that we measure. And then we, we have to look very closely at, because with the desert, it's, a, it's a, a balance between how much water you use and the salt buildup in your soil. Because a lot of the irrigation water that we bring onto the soil will have salt on it as well. And so it's, a, it's that management back and forth of, of managing salts and managing uh, your water. Mm. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. So um, uh, let's move to another question here. Uh, and I think maybe Dr. Orn can answer that. Uh, and it's about water requirement uh, for, for the desert tree. Um, uh, so, so what are the typical water requirements for the native desert trees and, uh, and, and what savings do you see? Regarding the native species tree that we conduct the research in the UAE is Salvadora, CC first and Gaff tree. The water usage per day is in the range of 16 to 12 liter per tree per day. And from the experiment that we conduct for the whole year, last year, we can see irrigation reduction up to 60% compared with the control. And with this in mind, it means that the operation time is also lesser. As I present that one third of the irrigation operation has been reduced or you, has been used to maintain the healthy tree. And this is all this native species tree is very important for the biodiversity because they produce flower and is the food of the animal and the beneficial insect. As Edgar has mentioned that he has surrounding the farm with the native species that use less water and provide food for the beneficial insect. It is very important part of the ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, another question uh, for, for, for Edgar, um, um, uh, when, when you look at um, investment in land upgrades, like, for example, this LNC project with things that will have a, a lasting impact on, on changing the ecosystem of your, your soil, uh, is it from a, from a agribusiness perspective, are these things viewed as, uh, as sort of a a capital expenditure, or is it on, more on the operational side that you uh, account for these things? And 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 if you if you view sort of this land upgrade as a capex, uh, are there any specific advantages of that? Yes. Um, no, we definitely. You know, we actually we haven't been against uh, deciding. You know what this is going to be, but we had a talk uh, with my uh, CFO. And we decided to do it as a capex, okay? Uh, because it just, it makes sense. You know, we're impacting uh, so, which is an asset of your farm and um, in time, right? Um, now, it's very difficult to see this as a, as a cost um, for, a, for a year uh, season or for a crop season um, as a fertilizer or as a soil amendment, right? Um, so we decided to do it as a capex uh, on five year, on a five year span. 
uh, which I think is, is, it gives us a great advantage uh, over time um, to integrate this into our cost structure. So yes, it's CapEx. So, so, so that means you, you, you view it as, a, as a basically an upgrade of the land, and then you, uh, you, you measure your, your um, returns on that with uh, what you said, the savings on water, fertilizers, energy, and how it impacts the yield then. Yeah, that's, that's how we're going to visualize it, because it's, it's the way that it makes the most sense to us, right? You are impacting an asset, and, and for that, you're creating or you're having the advantage of, of like you mentioned, you know, what, how much are we going to save in water? How much by reducing cycles in irrigation, how much are we going to impact in that cost of, of fuel? Uh, how much are we going to impact in the cost of labor uh, and so on? So all of this formula is what we integrated in a five-year plan in, 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 in our project. So yeah, we call it a CapEx and that's how we're going to be seeing and measuring those effects back to the land. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's definitely makes sense to sort of uh, uh, use this for, uh, for upgrading the existing uh, land areas. Um, I mean, we see that, uh, that I mean, Agricultural land is an asset that is increasing uh, quite significant in value. I think uh, if we go back 10, 10 20 years, uh, you know, till today, it's, it's, it's more than doubled. Uh, um, uh, is there a view that this could be used to, to actually create more agricultural land? Because we're losing agricultural land at, at scale, really, uh, uh, you know, by, by things that are being sold out to housing projects and, and, and commercial projects, et cetera. Um, uh, any thoughts on that? Yes, definitely. Uh, we, um, you know, if, uh, as we prove this, this concept, right? Um, you know, there's many areas in, when you're farming a global scale, you're, you're always trying to see, you know, which land makes the most sense. Um, and with that, for example, you know, when, when you're around urban areas, you know, you feel that pressure of the urban world. And, um, and we have to look for other alternatives that will maintain, you know, our, our business balance. So yes, you know, in, in terms of, for example, one of our properties uh, in, in the Mojave Desert in Cadiz, uh, there's a tremendous potential, why? Because we, we, we have many, many acres that, you know, you might drive by and say, what is this people doing here? There's not even grass growing. Um, but you have to stop and, 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 and take a look uh, deep into it. But yes, there's great opportunities. And that's why, you know, we're looking for all this frontiers for this. Yes, there's more ways of making land to do farming. Mm. Yeah, and when you look deep into that area specifically, what you find is water resources. And then where there is water, there is, uh, there is hope. And then it's about utilizing that in the best way. So um, a question on the LNC here as well. Um, um, uh, so the question is, is LNC suitable for uh, any kind of desert sands? Or Norshadi, will you uh, answer that? Yeah, the um, general answer is yes. It's to any type of sand. Um, so before we applied the LNC, actually, we we um, did the sieve um, analysis, which is the sand particle size distribution. And based on that distribution, we formulate the LNC. Um, so the sand, um, that's a general term, but we have coarse sand, uh, we have medium sand, fine sand, very fine sand, and but all of them, underlie on the same umbrella, which is the sand. Um, they vary in, in the properties. 
um, but they, relatively speaking, share the same, um, I would say, the behavior, which is a good drainage and, and aeration. And um, the um, short uh, answer is yes. Um, LNC is applicable to all kinds of sands. Yeah, to add to Dr. Shadi as well, some of the criteria that will be limit the ability of the LNC is the soil that have high clay or percent clay that's above 6% in the soil that we are working with and the high in organic matter. The rest of the sandy soil is we happy to work with. Yeah. Thank you. So what about uh, to use um, LNC or um, uh, soil uh, regeneration and, and biodiversity initiatives to also capture CO2 at the same time is a question we get here. Um, any thoughts on, on, on that from your side, Edgar, uh, on, uh, on, on CO2? Is that something you're, you're looking at, carbon capture um, as, as part of the equation? Yes, um, we're doing, and we're currently doing so, um, you know, because many times we do, you know, we do practices, but I, like I said before, if, if we don't, if we don't really measure uh, things, we can't, um, or it's difficult to move forward because you don't have a benchmark, you don't have a threshold to, to look for. So capturing CO2 is definitely one of those now. Farmers have been doing practices over thousands of years that um, help and um, to capture CO2, but it's just that we've never, you know, going into the face of, of actually measuring in the impact that we cause. Uh, but definitely, you know, this is something that we're working with um, also with the uh, CDFA, which is the California Department of uh, Food and Agriculture. Uh, to establish, uh, you know, those those benchmarks because, you know, is it is it two tons? Is it five tons? Is it ten tons of uh, compost or any material that is the most effective in terms of capturing carbon? But yes, definitely, this is some of the other thresholds that we are measuring um, going forward. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and and there is also lots of um, uh, scientific publications uh, that have uh, you know documented clear indications of a higher um, uh, uh, presence in a soil of um, especially uh, you know um, uh, large surface area particles such as clays and minerals with high cationic exchange capacity correlates to an increased capacity to uh, actually capture to absorb and to restore and retain that carbon over time as well so so it's uh, it's it's an exciting area uh, but it needs more work from a scientific perspective of actually getting the measurements and how you document it and how do you qualify into these gold, vera, whatever uh, uh, carbon uh, certificate standards uh, uh, you will work with as well. Um, I think, um, um, I mean, we have quite a lot of questions coming in, um, uh, but we are uh, over time. So I think uh, that we will round off for here and then we will do a written Q&A uh, part on the remaining questions uh, that we will share with the entire uh, audience uh, as well. So um, I would thank uh, everyone for uh, joining this uh, webinar session today and a special thanks to our um, esteemed uh, speakers and uh, panelists here. It's been wonderful to host you and uh, we want to uh, turn this into a, um, um, a webinar series going forward. So we'll be inviting various speakers uh, from time to time and, uh, and um, uh, address various topics under sort of the umbrella of resilient agriculture. So uh, stay tuned for the next session that will come up. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone. Have a, a wonderful and productive uh, day, uh, rest of your day or evening. And uh, <laughs> We will see you soon uh, and uh, continuing to uh, spread hope uh, for uh, the uh, ability to actually create resilient agriculture, even in a drying world, uh, mm -hmm. and to turn sand into hope and prosperity. 
Thank you very much.